Even our greatest scientists of today still can't explain to us how many dimensions actually exist, much less even trying to explain what these dimensions even look like. We're gonna be going over intense detail in regards to the 11 dimensions with even the people that have been studying this for decades. If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Nikola Tesla. These words still resonate within the consciousness of our scientists and physicists today. And when we talk about the possibility of other dimensions existing, this particular quote certainly holds significance. You are looking through a window into another world. Multiverse theory says that we live in multiple universes and are living simultaneously multiple lives as multiple versions of ourselves. And it goes on forever. How do these multiverses come to be? So, so you guys are asking me to talk about uh, a, a subject that's really complex. And most people, including myself, don't really, really understand dimensions. And the reason for that is that dimensions are part of mathematics. And the only way you're gonna really understand this stuff, me, you, most everybody in this world, is to learn the math that goes along with it. Um, the, math, the math of string theory of quantum mechanics, those maths are really, really difficult to understand. Before we can talk about the existence of other dimensions, it's very important to understand how we define a dimension in the first place. Starting with dimension zero, we see a very small point or a dot has no height, width, or length, therefore is inert. And if we take that one dot and create another one right next to it, we can then connect it with a straight line. This has length and is considered to be the first dimension. Any conversation about dimensions probably should start with what is a dimension? And that, that makes the first problem. Because for most of us, we know that we live in a three-dimensional world, but we don't understand it. And fourth, fifth, sixth dimensions, we really won't understand. And um, I think Brian Greene made this, quoted this line somewhere in the past. He said, when we were first um, getting out of the caves and, and, and we understood things about the world, we didn't sit around and think about quantum mechanics because we would be eaten. So the way we developed is in a three-dimensional world and we understand three dimensions. So let's, let's just talk about that. In order to get into the second dimension, we will replicate those two dots above or below and connect those to create a square or a rectangle. Now this particular shape is two-dimensional because it only has width and length. There is no height. So within its plane of perception, this particular object can only move right to left, forward or back, cannot move up and down. To institute the movement of going up and down and speaking about the third dimension, we add the aspect or the element of height. So a dimension, we can sort of define a dimension by how many pieces of information you need to be able to find an object on the surface of something. Not on the surface of something, but find an object. For instance, if I say to you that I'm gonna meet you on the corner of 42nd Street and 6th Avenue, right? I'm giving you two points of location. And you could use latitude and longitude just as easily, but people understand the corner of F Street and 1st Avenue. Now, if I ask you to meet me there, I'm giving you two pieces of information. What if there was a building on that, on that corner and I asked you to meet me in the building? Well, you would need to know what floor, wouldn't you? So that's your third dimension, it's the height. So the first two dimensions are length and width, and the third dimension is height. Okay, so if I told you to meet me on the third floor of 42nd Street and 6th Avenue, you still couldn't meet me because you don't know what time. Okay, so what I've just described is the easy way to think about three dimensions. 
You've got height, you've got length, you've got width. And you as a person that's living in this three-dimensional world have access to all those things. I could go back and forth, sideways and up and down. I need an elevator, but I can go up and down. The thing that I can't do anything about is time. We live in a three-dimensional world with the fourth dimension being time. And it's time because if I want to meet you at four o'clock, I have to give you four o'clock. It's not enough for me to say, meet me on the corner of 42nd and, and 6th Avenue on the third floor. I have to tell you at three o'clock in the afternoon. And that's your fourth dimension. Now, I really enjoy one of the analogies that Neil Tyson deGrasse had mentioned when he explained the differences in perception between these first dimensions. For the sake of example, I'll talk about the second dimension and how a third dimensional object can exist within the second dimension, yet still not have bearing or significance on that individual energy's existence. Now, for the sake of the example, Anything that is existing on that two-dimensional plane obviously does not interpret a third-dimensional object. But the way that Neil put it, if you have a table surface and you continue to put pieces of paper on it, which represent two-dimensional objects, eventually you'll find that the table is full up. So what we would do in our reality is perhaps stack the papers. So he put forth a few bins and instead of having them strewn across the tabletop, he was then stacking them neatly and organizing them within the bins. The curious thing is that he introduced a consciousness, in this case an ant, and he described that this ant only existed within the two-dimensional space. So the perception of this ant does not know that the papers are still within the same space, but now stacked in way of height because it doesn't perceive height. So here's the curious thing. Perhaps we also, in our third dimensional space, already have other objects that exist within fourth, fifth, and sixth dimensional states going backwards and forwards. The theory goes like this. Scientists who are working on teleportation of atoms discovered that atoms could be split into two different places at once. So if we and our world around us are made of atoms, could a duplicate of ourselves be in another universe right now? The multiverse theory says that every action or choice we make splits our universe into two and creates a brand new universe starting from that moment we made that choice and begins a new universe from that starting point and then goes on forever. Now imagine, every choice made by every living human being and creature since the beginning of time, splitting the universe into two over and over and over again, creating a new multiverse throughout the world's history. It can boggle the mind. So I'm going to get to the fifth dimension, which starts getting wonky. And the reason it starts getting wonky is because it's no longer we can see you're on the third floor at four o'clock. We have to think about time in a different fashion. And what the fifth dimension allows you to do is travel across time in both directions. In other words, one up from the fourth dimension, which is time in one direction, because we can sort of, we're going forward in time, we're not going backwards in time. So in the fourth dimension, there's a forward motion of time. The line of time goes forward, we can't do anything about it. In the fifth dimension, if you're a being in the fifth dimension, you have to understand that time goes in both direction, plus the math says that we can have a multi-universe. So that's called a multiverse. So here's the interesting thing that I would like to propose. When we talk about a two-dimensional object observing a third-dimensional object coming into its space, we understand that this two-dimensional object will only see a small fraction, the surface area of that which is connecting with the second dimension. If you were to push this object through the second dimension, Again, the object that is observing will only see the fraction that is connecting with the second dimension as a flat plane. Therefore, in its reality, this is still flat, this object coming through, and it's not aware of the third dimensional element. So, within our third dimension, is it possible that if everything exists in the same space at the same time, only separated by frequency and vibration, that these objects of different dimensional capacity are sitting right here alongside with us. 
As the theory goes, you and I live in these multiverses, living similar and completely different lives. Some theorize that sometimes these parallel universes will cross paths or bump into one another just a few moments in time where one timeline is maybe 30 seconds ahead of the other. And at these strange moments, we can become aware with a strange sense of familiarity as if we have experienced this moment before and in some cases able to even know what is to be said or done in the following moments before it happens. If I was to consider the fact that there could be a being in the fifth dimension, that being could travel across universes. If there's a multiple universe, that being could recreate themselves in multiple, in multiple timelines. Now, I know that's horrible to think about, but let me, let me, so, let me see if I can sort of explain it. So visualize a timeline, and we can draw the picture, and somewhere between now and the future, I go by myself a Mercedes, and I drive around in the Mercedes for 20 years. And, and if I'm a fifth dimension being, I can say to myself, you know what, I don't like this Mercedes. I'm going to go back in time to when I bought this Mercedes and buy myself a BMW. And I can do that because I'm a being in the fifth dimension. So I go back, buy myself a BMW, except for one thing. I'm already going in my Mercedes. That doesn't stop. That, you, that, that universe is going. I'm, you know, I'm driving my Mercedes. Now my second copy just bought a BMW and is driving that BMW. Those two realities exist together. Now, when we look at different geometric shapes, which is really the crux of how this reality is built, we can certainly define first, second, and third dimensional shapes, but what about a fourth dimensional shape? Maybe some of you are familiar with the Tesseract, which is a very interesting fourth dimensional representation of what a shape may look like. Again, this is simply a blueprint of interpretation. The actual experience would be much more mind boggling for us to come into contact with one of these shapes. There have been people during the shift of this planet moving from one place to another in way of vibration, and I'll bring that up a little bit later. They have witnessed what they explained to be fourth dimensional objects popping into our reality and poof, popping out. So that's curious to think about that these objects may still be around us, but separated by vibration and frequency. String theory has been held up as a possible theory of everything, as a single framework that could unite general relativity and quantum mechanics. Two theories that underline almost all of the modern physics. What quantum mechanics does very well in describing the behavior of very small things, and general relativity works well to explain how very large things happen in the universe. They do play nicely together. Some scientists think or thought that studying the theory could resolve the conundrums between the two, conquering one of the major remaining unsolved problems of physics. But after the string theory gained prominence in the late 1960s and 70s, its popular among theoretical physicists fluctuated according to lecture by California Institute of Technology. Physicist John Swartz, widely considered one of the founders of string theory after countless conferences and dry erase markers, the breathtaking breakthrough many once hoped for seems further away than ever. So, if the multiverse theory is correct, then could our dreams also be accounts of parallel lives? Is there a way to truly travel between these multiverses? Dimensions. Now, we've been bombarded with this term in movies and books and TV for years now. Even though it is portrayed in sci-fi, dimensions are a very real thing. There are said to be 11 dimensions, if not more. But unfortunately, we as humans are limited to perceiving three of those dimensions. The first dimension just being basically a straight line. The second dimension, which gives us width, creating a plane. And then the third dimension, which gives us height, giving us 3D. Now, time is not spatial, and all time happens at once. It is our perception that creates the illusion of time. Now, imagine a bunch of animation cells for a cartoon, let's say. Each cell is a moment in time in a single frame. Now, 
we know if we look at a single frame, it's just a frozen moment. But you take multiple moments and you look at them quickly as they zoom by you like a film projector. Those moments come to life and time is perceived. The best representation of this was a scene in a movie, Interstellar, with Matthew McConaughey. We can visually see this concept. The fifth dimension allows a being, if possible, to move forward and backward in time. This is extraordinary. Right now, science can't tell us for sure 100% that a being could live within the fifth dimension, but they can't deny that it isn't in fact possible that a life form could exist in the fifth dimension. And if so, the power of that being would be extraordinary. The power of this life form, if it had intelligence, could maybe manipulate its own reality, moving from the future to the past to present, manipulating in a way that has an aspect of full control of your life, basically immortality. So now we get to the sixth dimension. And the sixth dimension says that a sixth dimension being can do everything they can do in the fifth dimension, but across universes that had the same starting conditions. What do I mean by that? We think that this universe began with the Big Bang. So every other universe that began with a Big Bang fits into the sixth dimension. So you can go across timelines, you can go across universes, you can go back and forth, you can buy your Ferrari. So instead of going, instead of going back, in order to get back to where I bought the Mercedes, I have to go to the future back here. In the sixth, in the sixth dimension, I don't need to do this. I can just go here. Moving into how dimensions in way of what we found may actually coincide with music, I have to tell you, this is a very interesting continuity. Now, musical scales are comprised of 12 notes. Well, 11, if you want to be specific, the root and the octave being the same note, but separated by two different frequencies. Within this, we understand that the general consensus is that science believes 11 dimensions exist within a certain tier. So within these 11 dimensions, we have sub-dimensions that also have their own mathematical components. For example, if you start at the root, you're in the first dimension. If you go up to the second note in the scale, you're in the second dimension and so forth. But once again, these are all separated by specific frequency bands. Within those dimensions, again, you have sub-dimensions that have their own quantification and are necessary to create the entire band of frequencies that we just might call our reality. Now, this is just one interpretation. This is one perception of one dimension that we can agree on, the third dimension. What if we had access to the intangible fourth dimension or second dimension the way that we would experience it? It's not just to intellectualize, it's actually to experience these things that propels us forward in our knowledge and understanding. Portals and stargates have been recorded throughout history through ancient texts, art, petroglyphs, storytelling, and legends. What is a portal? Well, the definition for the word portal is a doorway, a gate, or other entrance, especially a large and imposing one. Now, portals are known to exist in all parts of the world, from Sedona, Arizona, Iraq, Egypt, Europe, Africa, Antarctica, most tribal land, just to name a few. Now, these portals are said to be an opening between two worlds, like a controlled tear in the fabric between worlds. Ancient tribal elders tell stories of these ancestors uh, who would meet and communicate with beings from the other side of these doorways. It has been said that certain societies in our history that completely vanished without a trace were said to have traveled through these portals to higher dimensional realms because they had reached a level of consciousness that was beyond our perceived three dimensions. In South Africa, the sand people are said to possess the power and ability to travel to other dimensions and realms, just like the aboriginals in Australia. In certain ways, we've been able to explain this very minimally. With the double slit experiment performed many years ago, the long story short is that a photon should follow a natural trajectory and continue on that unabated unless interrupted. 
nobody realized that was conducting the experiment, the interruption would be the observation to that particular process. Now think about that for a moment. If our observation changes the outcome of something that has not only happened now or is going to happen, but also can change things that have already happened, the idea of thoughts manifesting takes on a whole new significance. Now, in way of dimensions and how we explain this, we understand that, again, in quantum physics, there are neutrons and photons that exist in two places or more at one time, almost as if they have infinite potential until we come in and give the direction. Again, this is very empowering to think about and certainly puts a different spin on what we understand to be physical reality. So now we get to the seventh dimension, and, and, and that brings into the fact that we really don't know how the universes can begin. The theory says that if there's a multiverse, then every possible combination of factors can be created. So in the, in the seventh dimension, you can go across every universe regardless of how it was created. If you're in the ninth dimension, you can actually have multiple entities living in the same place at the same time. And they would never know about each other. And that's the funny thing about dimensions, is that you can be in another dimension if there is such a thing as a being from another dimension, and you wouldn't know it. Now, a Stargate is a little different. It is an Einstein-Rosenbridge portal device that allows practical, rapid travel between two distant locations through a transversible wormhole that can send someone to another location light years away nearly instantaneously. This idea is portrayed in the movie Stargate. And it is said that the Gulf War with Saddam Hussein was actually over a Stargate. That Saddam possessed a large pyramid-like structure that he had built known as the Sumerian Staircase or the Stairway to Heaven. And America wanted to get their hands on it. The story of the Tower of Babel recently has been said to actually be a Stargate. And when God saw the power man had accomplished, he destroyed the tower and made everyone who spoke speak in gibberish so they couldn't communicate and build it again. Well, as time went on, humans seemed to be at it again. In Europe, scientists are working on the CERN Collider, doing just that, and they're not hiding it. They have said multiple times that they are opening doorways to other realms and dimensions, and, quote, they don't know what might come out of it, and it's exciting. Now, when you look back into ancient cultures, and we talk about some of the purported high technology they may have had, it seems they also had an understanding of these natural formations in way of frequencies and vibrations. Audio levitation is a very good example and has been demonstrated up to the present day that this is something that does exist as a way for us to move physical matter. So in understanding some of these ancient cultures to the degree that we have, there's a whole myriad of questions we still sit on wondering how they got to a certain point in their evolution. Could it be that they already understood to some degree how these different dimensions coincided and then were able to apply that knowledge in a very specific fashion? Perhaps we as individuals and collectively have lost that knowledge but are now once again turning our heads towards that horizon in inquiry. In 1904, a little girl was born and her name was Dorothy Eddy. Now, she claimed to be the reincarnation of the pharaoh Amseti. She was able to actually read hieroglyphs with ease and helped archaeologists find some of the greatest treasures in Egypt, including the location, Abydos, that were buried and forgotten. She knew exactly where things were. She also said she knew how to open these ancient portals and gates and knew how they worked from when she was a child, but said that they had been closed far too long and would not open anymore. As I researched her story, it reminded me of the older woman in the movie Stargate that is a head of the Stargate project and sets the main characters on their destiny. Did Dean Devlin, the creator of the franchise Stargate, know something and the only way to tell the world was through storytelling? But let me ask you this. What if you could see what could be a real portal or Stargate? What would it look like? 
Well, then you would need to travel to South America where scientists and locals are baffled. In a mountain, there is a road tunnel. And in this tunnel, there is a phenomenon that has kept scientists and people alike baffled. Some say it's a portal opening. Locals say it's the mountain breathing and opening passages to other worlds. Look for yourself. I think that as time goes on, we're going to find more answers in way of this malleable reality that we have always believed to be incredibly rigid. What if we really could mold our lives and the things that we experience like clay? Well, it's very possible when you talk about out-of-body experiences and those who have passed on and then come back from a near-death experience, that what they report to be a different frequency could certainly just be another realm of existence. When you talk about the paranormal, many investigators, purposefully or unintentionally, have gone out and witnessed many different anomalies that they can't explain. Shadow figures, whispered smoke that forms into a human-like form, certain sounds that are captured on frequencies based in radio. These are all connected, and I think that there is a certain continuity that we're going to start really observing in way of, again, a collective when it comes to understanding how these other dimensions are connected within ours integrally. And if we were able to remove the third dimensional frequency, it would cause the rest of these dimensions to collapse. All of them tied intricately together. And we understand that there are many theories to explain this. String theory, of course, being one. In Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity, gravity is a force that wraps space and time around a mass of objects. It is one of the four forces that physicists use to describe nature. But unlike other forces, electromagnetism, the strong force and the weak force, gravity is so weak that it cannot be detected or observed on the scale of a particle. Its effects are only noticeable and important on the scale of moons, planets, and galaxies. Gravity seems not to exist as a particle of its own either. Theorists can predict what a galaxy particle should look like, but when they try to calculate what happens when the two gravitations smash together, they get an infinite amount of energy packed into a small space. A sure sign according to astrophysicist Paul Sutter that the Earth is missing something. One possible solution with theorists borrowed from nuclear physicists in the 1970s is to get rid of the idea of the problematic point. Point like gravitation particles, strings and only strings can collide and rebound cleanly without implying physically impossible infinities. The flurry of the thought around the very idea of string theory has left a deep imprint on both physics and math. Like it or not, some physicists certainly don't. String theory is here to stay. String theory is a framework that physicists use to describe how forces usually conceptualize on a gigantic level, like gravity, could affect tiny objects like electrons and protons. The tenth dimension is what some people say, this is where God lives. You have total control over time, space, um, motion, everything. You can do anything you want in any universe you want to do it in. And then there's the 11th dimension. So the 11th dimension is mathematical like the rest of them are. And the 11th dimension, according to string theory, is where strings are and exist. Everything happens from the 11th dimension up or out. So those are dimensions the way I understand them. And a caveat to this conversation, I told Brenton Blake, that if you have a theoretical physicist listening to this, what he might say is, yeah, okay, that's an easy explanation. There's no, I didn't go into the depth because frankly, I'm not sure that I understand the depth. Albert Einstein calls it the 4D universe, a space-time world where he theorizes where the past, present, and future all come together. The infinite power of God-like powers is interesting to think about. If you could imagine a possible extraterrestrial life form able to tap into a frequency or some kind of technology that could open up the dimensions and utilize this God-like power to travel across the universe at the speed of thought. Now, one of the curious things I've observed and yet don't have a definitive theory on yet, but I'm working on it 
that again, when we look at the musical notes and we look at the dimensions and how they coincide, once again, we believe that there are 11 dimensions. Once again, we understand that there are technically 11 notes in a scale, minus the unison. If it is true that within string theory that some of these very minuscule dimensions actually curl upon each other, could it be that where they connect is the root note and the octave? Just something to think about and, I hope, to hear expounded on. Who doesn't like movies? It's those times where you get to escape your worldly woes and dive into another world living vicariously through the characters. But what most people don't know is that Hollywood has been desensitizing us for decades. To the ideas through science fiction, when in fact they have been slowly under the radar, you might say, feeding us info and ideas through the form of entertainment, planting seeds in our minds. Just look at all the technology that we have today that 50 years ago was just science fiction and not real. So. Who's to say that Stargates won't be a part of our lives one day sooner than we think? Could humankind one day reach a level of consciousness that will finally let us all graduate to a higher dimension? What kind of future technology can we look forward to seeing jump from the film screen to reality in the coming years foreshadowing our future? How are Stargates and portals opened? One theory is sound frequency. We have just recently discovered some of the mysteries of sound and frequency through the new science of cymatics, where, where we have learned that every note frequency creates a unique pattern. Now, if we played just the right notes in the right order or in unison, could create a vibrational combination to open a cosmic doorway. Now, if you go to Roslyn's Chapel in Scotland, you will see that there is a series of stone cubes with individual patterns on them. My thought is, what if these patterns on these cubes are visual images of certain tone frequencies and these pattern cubes on the ceiling are musical notes that could open a doorway when played in the right order? Something else I'd like to touch upon briefly is the possibility that some of these entities that we come into contact with, whether they be extraterrestrial or cryptid, it seems that they have some understanding of how these dimensions work. Davy Crockett had an interesting experience with a Bigfoot type creature that manifested in front of him and then dissipated just as quickly as it left. In many cases, there have been sightings of Bigfoot that have been tracked and it seems like at a moment's notice, this particular animal or creature disappears. It's often been purported that they have multidimensional capacity. So why don't we consciously have that thought? Why don't we consciously have that knowledge? I think the answer is much more simple than we've surmised. Many times you have species that are evolving parallel to each other. We can even find this within Darwin's theory of evolution and of course peripherally as well. What I think happened in certain cases was that these species, let's say we are on the right, let's say Bigfoot's on the left, continued to grow in a parallel fashion and evolve. At one point, we decided to take more of a left-brained approach, which brought us to technology and an outside interpretation and way of defining ourselves. What happened with Bigfoot is it continued on that right brain path and instead of developing technology the way that we have done outwardly, it was more in touch with its intuition and the specified tools that we all carry to traverse these different dimensions. For example, when you talk about sacred geometry and you look back to the teachings of Dronvalo Melchizedek, he tells us that the Merkava, two tetrahedrons right on top of each other that are in each of our auric fields, once they are activated and spin opposite, we can simply move through these vibrations even physically. Now, if that's true, this knowledge is out there and it's up to us to garner it, capture it, and then apply it to our own lives. We're stuck in the 3D world, obviously. Would it be possible in the future to tap into these other dimensions and possibilities, theories say that it would be pretty much impossible to do but there are theoretical theories out there that say maybe just maybe we may be able to crack the code of dimensions something to think about